to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know, the latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. This guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, welcome back. It's just gone two o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom. The Vatican has announced the death of Pope Benedict XVI at the age of 95. Pope Benedict was the head of the Catholic Church from 2005 until his resignation in 2013. He became the first pontiff to step down from the role in 600 years due to old, old age and ill health. Pope Francis will lead his funeral on the 5th of January at St Peter's Square. Well, the associate editor at the Catholic Herald, Simon Caldwell, spoke to GB News about Pope Benedict's legacy. Benedict wasn't going to allow people to come in with all kinds of novelties and uh, revolutionary reforms and this kind of thing. He, he said, no, this, this, is, this is a sacred deposit. This is, this is something which, uh, we, we, this, is what, this is what we hold to be true. And it wasn't that he was against homosexuals or, or, or against women or anything like that. He was, he was upholding... 2,000 years of, of, of Christian teaching and said, so this, this is what it means to be a Christian. Four lionesses who won the Women's Euro 2022 are among those recognised in the New Year Honours List, the first to be issued by King Charles. Captain Leah Williamson has been made an OBE, whilst Lucy Bronze, Beth Mead and Ellen White have been given MBEs. GB News presenter Anne Diamond has received an OBE for her services to public health and charity. And Queen guitarist and animal welfare campaigner Brian May has received a knighthood. It's a it's a nice surprise to um to have this honor put upon me. I also think it's um it comes with a responsibility to behave uh well I guess to continue to behave in a way which uh, benefits the country and the rest of the population here and and the world as well, you know, but I take this responsi responsibility quite seriously anyway. 
The Prime Minister has admitted the last 12 months have been tough and warned the UK's problems won't go away next year. In his New Year message to the UK, Rishi Sunak said the government will continue to tackle the NHS backlog and illegal immigration. He also said King Charles's coronation will bring the country together. I'm not going to pretend that all our problems will go away in the new year. But 2023 will give us an opportunity to showcase the very best of Britain on the world stage. In this historic year of His Majesty the King's coronation, we will come together with pride in everything that makes this country great. Yes, 2023 will have its challenges, but the government I lead is putting your priorities first. The government has confirmed anyone travelling directly from China to England from the 5th of January must show a negative Covid test before their departure. There are no direct flights from China to Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, but the government says it will work with devolved nations to ensure measures are implemented there. It's amid concerns about surging cases in China following an easing of restrictions. France, Spain and the US also have introduced similar rules. Russia's, Russia's defence ministry says, sorry, sorry about that. I believe um, if you're watching us on TV, you are seeing some Australia pictures there, but I'm going to bring you that in just a second. But first, Russia's defence ministry says 82 of their soldiers who were captured by Ukraine have been released in the latest prisoner exchange between the two sides. Ukraine is yet to comment on the claims. Meanwhile, the mayor of Ukraine's capital, Kiev, says 10 explosions have been heard in the city after air raid sirens were sounded in every region of the country. Now it is time for those special New Year pictures. Celebrations have already begun across the world with New Zealand and Australia welcoming in 2023 first. In Sydney, the New Year was ushered in with fireworks over the iconic Harbour Bridge and Opera House. And wait for it, here they come. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant scenes there. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. We'll bring you more updates in half an hour. But now it's time for an on-the-money end-of-year special with Liam Halligan. To this GB News economic special, we'll be looking back at 2022 and forward to 2023. These are tough economic times, but there are plenty of opportunities too. The UK economy expanded by about 3.5% in 2022, and we're set to contract in 2023. What does all this mean for you and your family? Stay with us. This is Liam Halligan, and you're on The Money. Yes, indeed, these are difficult economic times. The newspapers, the television and radio, full of economic news, strikes, rising interest rates, but also investment too in the UK economy. So what does it mean for us all? Well, I'm delighted to join a fantastic panel. Dr. Gerard Lyons, you are the Chief Economic Strategist at NetWealth. Thanks so much for joining us. What do you make of the fact that the UK is still set to be the fastest growing economy in the G7 in 2022. Well, the UK economy rebounded strongly from the pandemic. Policy measures helped. But what we've seen as the year has progressed is that the economy has started to lose momentum. And indeed, we're now in a very difficult situation. So much so, the best way to think about the next year is the good, the bad and the uncertain. The good is that inflation is set to decelerate, albeit from very high levels. The bad is that the economy will be in recession. And the uncertain is that we don't know how much inflation is going to fall by. The uncertain is we don't know how high interest rates will have to go. And the uncertain is that we don't know how the economy, property prices, and indeed the financial markets will respond to that economic outlook. Uncertainty is indeed the watchword here. But you're predicting, Gerard, that inflation, it's 11.1% as we're recording this. Yeah. Uh, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index is 11.1% higher in November 2022 compared to the same month the year before. You think that CPI number, that inflation number, the cost of living squeeze will come down? 
Yes, absolutely. Let's put this in perspective. So 18 months ago at Net Wealth, we asked which P will inflation be? Will it pass through? Will it persist? Or will it be permanent? We thought the Bank of England, even then, was completely wrong when it said it was going to pass through quickly. And that's led to inappropriate monetary policy over the last 18 months. We thought at net wealth inflation would persist, and it has persisted. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, even though it's very high now, inflationary pressures are going to persist. But inflation now, double digits, will start to decelerate. But we still are seeing inflation being above wages now, so people are feeling the cost of living squeeze. So the good news is that inflation now above 11%, hardly good news in itself, is that by the end of next year, inflation will be down to maybe 5 or 6%. Still way higher mm. than the inflation the target. The Bank of England target is 2%, 2 right? 2%, which shows how farcical it is mm. that the Bank of England, 18 months ago, and indeed, even at the beginning of this year, 2022, were still behind the curve in saying what they needed to do to keep inflation under control. Victoria Scholar, Great to have you with us. You are Head of Investment at Interactive Investor. You're very much uh, a creature of the city and financial markets. You follow financial markets extremely closely. Is there a consensus, would you say, across the city that what Gerard Lyons says is right, that the Bank of England has been behind the curve? On the other hand, we've seen interest rates go up from just a quarter of 1% in January 2022, all the way up to 3%. In December 22, at the end of the year, so they have gone up sharply, but do you think the Bank of England started too late? Well, actually, the Bank of England was ahead of the pack because it was the first major global central bank to push higher in terms of interest rates post-pandemic. You know, it lifted off in December of last year, and it was the first central bank to do so. Um, and we've seen incremental rate rises over the course of this year. The Fed, meanwhile, has been playing the US central up. bank, the Federal yeah, Reserve. In the United States, we've been seeing more aggressive interest rate hikes over recent months um, because it was trying to play catch up because it was lagging behind in terms of the inflation picture. I don't envy the Bank of England. It has a very difficult task of trying to control inflation that's largely being imported from abroad. It's been driven by factors like problems with the global supply chain post-pandemic, as well as geopolitical trends with the war in Ukraine, which has mm. sent commodity prices sharply higher. And of course, interest rates target borrowing. It looks at raising mortgage rates to try to curtail economic activity in the domestic economy, whereas what's really driving inflation is um, factors that the Bank of England doesn't have much control over at all. And of course, we had that squall after the so-called mini budget when Liz Truss was Prime Minister, Kwasi Kwarteng was Chancellor. Suddenly, everybody in the British media had to try and understand what a guilt market is. Yeah. Of course, you, you know well it's the market for government debt those prices, those interest rates that the government has to pay to borrow money spiked up sharply. They've come down since. There is still a little bit of turmoil on financial markets. How would you summarise what stocks and shares have done over the last year, Victoria? Well, if we look at the FTSE 100, it's the more main of a, index of shares. Exactly. Okay. It's more of a global outward looking index. So it's not really a reflection of the UK economy. What it does consist of is oil companies like BP and Shell, which have benefited from the war in Ukraine in terms of pushing oil prices higher. We've seen bumper profits there. We've also seen um, a large portion of financial stocks in the sector. Now, those tend to do better in a rising rate environment because they can earn more on their loans. And then mine have fared pretty well as well. If we look at the FTSE 250, however, that has suffered a lot more. That's, That's more UK focused, isn't it? Yeah, it's the, more the medium sized companies. Yeah, it's more closely correlated to the UK economy. Mm. And we've seen that fluctuate and a lot of volatility there in line with what we've seen with the turmoil, both in terms of the economics and the politics this, this year, like the mini budget and the fallout for the gilt market. So um, the FTSE 100 largely has been pretty resilient, whereas the FTSE 250 has struggled and the pound has also suffered as well. Let's talk to you, Helen Barnard. You are from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, an incredibly distinguished organisation, campaigning against poverty, awarding grants and so on. It's great to have you with us. This cost of living squeeze, it's really hit hard, hasn't it, across the UK? It absolutely has. It's almost as if it's been designed to make things hardest for those right at the bottom. And I think it's worth remembering, we've actually come into it from a really weak position. So we entered the pandemic having had a couple of years where deep poverty and destitution had already spiked up. You had COVID, where people on low incomes experienced both the heaviest health and economic impacts. So there we saw people ran down savings, they built up debt when they, on low incomes, 
and then the cost of living crisis hit. And of course, it's been driven by food prices and energy prices. It's the essentials which people at the bottom disproportionately spend their money on. And I think the effects we've seen have been probably unprecedented. I mean, we did work even back in the spring. At that point, around 7 million households had had to go without essentials. That's kind of as, as many people as in the north of England were going without food. That's more than one in five households. There's like 32 million households in the UK, right? I mean, it is a staggering number. What we also saw was, as well as that day-to-day -day hardship, people were also building up debt. And this is one of the things that is going to be an overhang, I think, from this, because what we're seeing is millions of people behind with bills, they're in arrears, they may never be able to pay this stuff off. And we've seen people turning to high cost credit mm. just to try and keep a roof over their head and the bills ticking over. Payday loans, doorstep loans, Payday loans all of those things, broking absolutely. And, so on. and actually, we're already seeing what you could think of as kind of a third wave of impacts, which is the mental health effects of all this, the effect on people's relationships. We're hearing from some of the charities, which are often kind of canary in the mines before official stats come through. So domestic abuse charities saying they're seeing a spike in demand and need for them. Food banks, debt advice. So this has been a real perfect storm for people. And there's been just an incredible level of fear and anxiety, actually, that people have felt all year about how they are going to survive. Jerry Lyons, it's incredible when you think back to 2022, how fast the policy mix has shifted. Back in March, Rishi Sunak as Chancellor, crikey, he only increased benefits, as I'm sure Helen remembers, by 3.1% at a time when inflation was already gearing up. Uh, and he said that would be fine. We've just had a huge increase in benefits. We've had a big 10% inflation-linked index uh, index increase in the basic state pension. The government's spending a huge amount of money. You're, you're very much a recognised expert when it comes to fiscal policy and the national accounts and so on. Could the fact that the government is spending and borrowing so much backfire, leading to another crisis on the gilts market, which I was discussing there with Victoria, or when you look across the major economies, is UK borrowing pretty much middle of the pack and likely to be OK? OK. Just before I answer your question yeah. specifically, back in March, it was quite clear that the Chancellor then should have raised benefits in line with inflation. I remember criticising it on the day of his spring budget. The good news in the latest statement from Chancellor Hunt was that at least there was a 92p increase in the national minimum wage. But So they're trying to make up for some of that, but there is still a lot more that needs to be done. But coming back to your question, yeah, we probably have become too pessimistic about what fiscal policy can do. That is, I still think there is more room for manoeuvre. Clearly, in the wake of Kwasi Guatan's mini budget, which spooked the markets, although it wasn't helped them by the markets being in the febrile state and the Bank of England not being seen to have done enough to keep inflation under control. Mm -hmm. But then we had the reaction where Chancellor Hunt felt that he had to be overly cautious. But when you look at the UK's debt to GDP ratio, it is very high, which means it's vulnerable to growth being weaker or interest rates being higher. But we are still the second lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7, highlighting the fact that this is a global problem, particularly a Western problem. Now, the best way to reduce debt to GDP down is actually grow the economy. The big challenge at the moment is that the approach being taken, almost being forced upon the Chancellor, is to almost be in the hole and dig deeper. When you're in a hold... The raising worst, taxes even more. Absolutely. The UK, unfortunately, is the only major economy raising taxes going into a global recession. I'm going to put you on the spot briefly, Victoria. The pound, what do you think will happen to the pound in 2023? Not least against the dollar. That's the rate that lots of people follow. Because if the pound gets weaker, that, of course, means our imports become more expensive and that pushes up inflation. If the pound gets stronger inflation goes down and the cost of living crisis eases. Yeah, and it's a good point. We haven't mentioned the fact that the pound is another contributor to the inflation problem this year because everything that we import becomes a lot more expensive. I think the outlook for the pound really depends on what happens with the dollar because the dollar has been extremely strong this year. It's been one of the only assets to really see huge upside. Um, and now we're starting to see a bit of a shift away from the greenback amid 
uh, sort of the expectation that the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, is going to ease off on its aggressive monetary tightening. So if we do start to see that the Fed does uh, become a little bit more cautious in terms of its interest rate increases, perhaps a 50 basis point move in December, Half a and percent, then yeah. And then some more moderate moves next year, we could see uh, some of that dollar strength come down. And as a result, we would likely see some of the riskier currencies like the pound uh, move higher against it. And finally, for, for now, from, for, from you, Helen, have you been surprised at the extent to which uh, this Conservative government has, albeit towards the end of the year, pushed public money towards more vulnerable households, towards pensioners, to try and mitigate this cost of living crisis? I mean, I think they did, they took the right decision. They did it very late though, they should have done it earlier. And it's worth saying that the rise in benefits doesn't kick in till next April. So actually what they've done is to leave people throughout the entire winter without extra help. And it's coming in at the point when actually things might be getting easier. Helen Barnard, Victoria Scholar, Jared Lyons, for now, stay with us. We've discussed the UK economy. After the break, we'll be discussing the world economy, Britain's place, in the global economy and what it means for you. Stay with us. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking mostly cloudy with outbreaks of rain, but drier and brighter in the northwest. Here's the details. It will be cold and rather cloudy across northern Scotland this afternoon. There will be some sunny spells at times, but also scattered wintry showers bringing snow to higher ground. The weather over Northern Ireland will be mostly dry with plenty of sunny spells developing. As we head into the afternoon, winds will be falling light. It will remain rather cloudy across northwest England with limited sunny spells here. There will also be some patchy rain or showers at times too. It will be very cloudy across Wales with cloud low enough to bring hill fog at times. There will be outbreaks of locally heavy rain with the driest conditions in the east. It will be overcast in the East Midlands this afternoon with prolonged at times heavy rain for all areas. It will be rather windy with strong gusts, feeling mild for this time of year. East Anglia will be cloudy throughout the afternoon with prolonged spells of locally heavy rain throughout. There will be some drier and brighter spells, but they will be limited. It'll be a windy afternoon across southern England, especially along the coast. It will be cloudy here with spells of locally heavy rain edging eastwards. Further spells of rain across southern areas while remaining cold in the north with wintry showers over northern Scotland. And that's how the weather's shaping up for the rest of the day. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess that I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. 
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. And welcome back to this On The Money end of year special. Before the break, we were talking about the UK. We're now going to talk about the global economy and how the UK fits into commerce across the world. Dr. Jared Lyons, great to have you with us. You are from Net Wealth. The US, the world's biggest economy, is set to expand by 0.5% in 2023, according to the OECD economic think tank. China, the world's second biggest economy, is set to expand by 4.6%. These are quite low growth numbers, aren't they, by US and particularly by Chinese standards? Absolutely. It's important to appreciate that in Britain, even though the economic outlook is difficult, it's difficult globally as well. It shouldn't make us feel any better, but it highlights the real challenge ahead. The world economy rebounded strongly post-pandemic. So 2021, it was very strong indeed. We started to see over the last year the world economy lose momentum. Now we effectively have a global recession. That's partly because the post-pandemic rebound has worn off and it's because inflationary pressures have forced interest rates up. In fact, the real challenge is not only that the world economy is in recession, is that the room for policy manoeuvre is limited. After the 2008 global financial crisis, the last real big challenge we had, policy was eased across the globe. Interest rates cut to very low levels. Fiscal policy, which is government spending and taxation, was eased as well. Now we have a situation where interest rates are having to rise outside of China across the globe. And we also have a situation where global public debt, so government debt, is at an all-time high. Yeah. So it's not just the private sector and individuals who are facing the pain. The room for policy manoeuvre is really And that's limited. very much a cost of lockdown crisis, Jared, Cost of right? lockdown, basically. Cost of lockdown, wrong policies for the wrong reasons at the wrong time, shall we say. But we are where we are. So the challenge is this, that if inflation doesn't really ease as much as, say, I and others hope it will, then it really constrains us. A big aspect of this inflation conundrum, Victoria Scholar, is, of course, energy prices, oil and gas. We haven't mentioned the war in Ukraine, a major feature of the global economic landscape of course, a humanitarian catastrophe, but it has worldwide economic fallout since February 2022. Oil prices, they were up above $100 a barrel back in the summer. They've eased slightly into the autumn and winter, around $80, $85 now. They remain crucial, don't they, where the oil price is to where the inflation outlook is going to go, as well as determining, of course, how much it costs to fill up our van and our car with petrol and diesel on the forecourt. Yeah, well, it's interesting because commodity prices as a whole are up by more than 20% this year. But that's actually not thanks to oil because oil spiked in the first quarter on the back of Putin's invasion of, U in, of Ukraine, of course. But since then, actually, oil prices have been coming lower and lower. And we're roughly about where we were at the start of the year. So those supply constraints that were bolstering price levels at the start of the year the focus has now shifted to the demand side and concerns about the potential for a global recession and particularly weakness in terms of demand coming from China have really pushed oil prices lower. Now, there's OPEC Plus, which is the organization of petroleum exporting countries, including Russia, that constantly monitors the market and has the room to change production. If it sees prices move too low, it can withdraw supply in order to try and 
boost supplies because obviously it wants mm. to generate more revenue from oil. So at its latest meeting, we saw no change, but there is the potential for it to constrain supply and there could be upside from there. But in terms of the demand picture, we are seeing oil demand soften and that's why prices have been coming down. Which may be good news for inflation. Isn't it incredible that Russia, not a member of OPEC, is now working hand in glove with OPEC, the Russians and the Saudis working together, very much to the annoyance of the US. You're right, Victoria, in the latest meeting, OPEC Plus kept their supply constraints where they were, but they've still taken two, two million barrels or so out of the market, uh, about 2% of global supplies, and that's really wound up the Western countries. These highfalutin conversations about energy, of course, Helen Barnard, they impact uh, all households in the UK, not least low-income households, the ones you focus on in your job at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. This has been the year 2022 when energy prices, domestic energy prices, have hit the headlines. Suddenly, everybody's looking at their utility bill extremely closely. And this has hit the poorest hardest, right? It absolutely has. And obviously, we saw the government cap the price, but it was capped at a level that was about double the previous year, which was mm. already unaffordable. We'll see in the spring, it will go up now to an average of about £3,000 per household. Now, we've got some protection for those at the bottom because we'll see that good, big boost in benefits according to inflation. But what we're going to see is some new threats, I think, coming in from the housing market particularly. So we're going to see thousands of people come off fixed rate mortgages, go on to far higher mortgages. We think that that could lead to anywhere up to 400,000 more people being pulled into poverty because of their housing costs Even going though up. they're homeowners? Even though they're homeowners, they are still at a low enough income that having to pay a substantially higher mortgage will pull them in. We've also, of course, got rents have been going up massively. Any, you know, they go anyone, up as interest rates go up because a lot of as, landlords yeah, have got mortgages. Absolutely. They've already been spiking. They're going to carry on spiking. And the bit of the benefit system the government hasn't increased is the support for low-income renters. Mm. So local housing, housing benefit, allowance, yeah. exactly. That is actually frozen in cash terms the way where it was in 2020. So mm. it's already wildly out of date. That is going to be the thing that is going to really torpedo people's living standards. Always fascinating and vital to focus on how these discussions we have about UK macroeconomics, the global economy, impact on ordinary people, particularly at the sharp end. Gerard, I wanted to touch briefly with you on trade. You follow trade very closely, the UK's exports and imports. How's our trade gone during 2022, particularly with Europe. There's so much uh, commentary that Brexit means the collapse in UK trade. The latest figures I saw from the ONS showed that UK exports to the EU were the highest on record. That's right. There's been recently a lot of focus on UK problems being linked to Brexit. But the reality is Western Europe faces the same challenges. And if we blame the issues facing the UK on Brexit, then we're actually focusing on the wrong problem. Basically, the UK faces a similar challenge to elsewhere. But you're right. Our trade performance with the EU is pretty much as one would expect given the performance of the EU economy. Ironically, it's our trade to the non-EU world that has underperformed. There was a very good report recently by Dr. Graham Gudgeon and two others from Cambridge looking at post-Brexit trends on this. But it comes back to one of the interesting points that you raised with Victoria. After Ukraine was invaded, we almost saw a G3 world emerge. Group one being America and its allies, group two being China and its allies, and group three being the non-aligned world who didn't want to be seen to be in America's back pocket and didn't want to alienate China. One of the interesting trends we've seen through this year... Is India and Brazil in that group, would you yeah, say? The yeah, absolutely. World? The non-aligned world. Some of the big emerging economies. Yeah. What we've seen in the last year has been the UK trying to have good relations with the EU. There still is a lot to be done there, but trying to reposition itself in what will be the big growth area of the world economy, not just this year, but in the next decade or so. That's the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. from India in the West to America in the East. And the real challenge is that the UK needs to become more competitive. Since 2008, since that global financial crisis, Britain has been, like Western Europe actually, Britain has become a low growth, low productivity, low wage economy. And it's not just people in benefits has been touched on at the end there. Victoria Scholar, we're not an investment show. We're not offering financial advice. Yeah. But you, what you do every day is you look at stocks and shares. You look at different sectors in great detail. Just briefly, 
During 2023, what do you think are the sectors to watch, particularly in the UK? Well, I think next year is all about positioning for a downturn and looking out for stocks and sectors that are going to do better as the UK and the global economy cools. So the technology sector, for example, has had a very rough ride over the last uh, 12 months because of the rising rate environment. Um, so the punch... Facebook and Google, all the, all the Silicon Valley companies. Yep. Um, the punch bowl of cheap money has been taken away and uh, the, these stocks have really, really struggled off the back of this. We know that the housing market is already starting to cool. That's coming through in the data. We're seeing house prices come down. Uh, that's likely to weigh on some of the big house builders. Um, so it's more about looking for defensive plays or stocks that potentially can um, navigate inflation a lot better. So the price makers rather than the price takers. So companies that are able to set their prices, raise prices without having a negative impact on demand. Um, so so yeah, things like pharmaceuticals, for example, might be quite good as a defensive play. Actually, also luxury stocks can be quite good because those at the very, very high end are relatively um, OK amid the broader pressures that a lot of people are under from the cost of living crisis. It's a trend, isn't it? A lot of the particularly wealthy did well during lockdown. Let's give the final word to you, Helen Barnard. What are your hopes for 2023 in terms of UK policy in order to try and make the world, or our part of the world at least, a better place? So as Joe was saying, we're in this low pay, low skill, low productivity economy. One of the things we can do is actually increase security at the bottom of the labour market, which is something that successive Conservative governments have been promising to do. That is something that can actually help to start pushing up people's living standards, their security, but also productivity. The other thing is the housing market. And I think one of the opportunities, we're going to see quite a lot of buy to let landlords, I think, get out of that market. If the government helps local authorities and housing associations buy up those properties, retrofit them, rent them out at affordable rents. Increase that stock of social increase housing. Increase the stock of social housing, properly affordable housing, without having to wait till you build more houses. And we've seen how hard that is. Mm. Those things could make a massive difference next year. Helen Barnard of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Great to have you with us. Victoria Scholar of Interactive Investor and Dr. Gerard Lyons of Net Wealth. Well, it has been a tough year in 2022. It could be tough again in 2023, but the UK is a wealthy country. Unemployment remains low. There is investment going on and there are policy measures we can take to make our lives better. Thanks a lot for joining me on this GB News end of year economic special. I'm Liam Halligan and that was On The Money. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. This guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, 
He's on it today. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. At the end of a tough year, I wanted to showcase some of the best of British charity. St Edmunds in Norwich, dedicated to the vocational training of youngsters, has just received a highly prestigious award from the Centre for Social Justice. I'm grateful to the CSJ and St Ed's for their help in making this film. Morning, nice Liam. Great. It's good to be here. St Edmunds in Norwich is no ordinary college. This award-winning charity provides vocational training to some 250 teenagers from across East Anglia. Some are regular school age, others are 16 plus. <laughs> Students at St Ed's, as it's known, have often been excluded from school, leaving with no qualifications. But they come here to succeed. Right, I think you'll be... Lorraine Bliss is St Ed's CEO, the driving force of this charity, which teaches teenagers hands-on skills that can earn them a living. All vocational wow, okay. through here. So there's cars and motorbikes? Yes, yeah, that's right. Over a million of our young people are not in education, employment or training for work, so-called NEETs. Their number have soared since Covid lockdown. These NEETs are St Ed's target audience, says Lorraine, and demand for places is high. One of the most popular courses is motor mechanics, motorbikes and cars, leading to a recognised city and guilds qualification. Daniel did badly at school. He rarely turned up. But he has a talent for fixing things and enjoys being at St Ed's. So it's just a belt which just spins. So when you give it a throw, it'll go, the piston will go up and then it'll like move the belt, like spin it. Being here makes sense to Daniel in a way that school never did. Why do you prefer this to school? Because it's like more hands on. I don't get treated like a child, I get treated like an adult. And why, why do you want to learn to be a, a motorbike mechanic? Uh, for the future, like, I just like fixing bikes, I like fixing cars, whatever. And I'm told you're really good at this? Yeah. And how's that make you feel? Good. Sam's story's similar. He found school boring and didn't get on with his teachers. At St Ed's, he's doing well. School was more of a chore, you know, something you had to do. You have to wake up in the morning, go there at a certain time. Whereas here, I, I enjoy coming here. I happily wake up in the morning and get here on time every day, get about half an hour early. Ashton also missed a lot of school, but tutors here say he's a star pupil, well capable of running his own business. Hopefully move on to doing some further learning. And it doesn't scare you fixing cars. It's all very complicated. Do you think you can handle it? Yeah, I can give it a go. <laughs> After his apprenticeship, Mike was a mechanic for 25 years until personal injury put him out of work. He says vocational training these days is sorely lacking. Need more of it. Need more of it about to help. Like me and myself, pen to paper, I, I didn't enjoy it. Hands on. Yeah, I loved it. Along with mechanics, St Ed's building department's also very popular. So when you've got enough glass on the wall, you couldn't move on stage too flat and too early. Kenzie found school tough and got into trouble. Guided by practically minded tutors, he's finding his way. What do your parents think that you're making such a success of this? To be fair, um, I know my parents are quite proud of me because they they've kind of seen me like 
Like I didn't go to school a lot, but they can see that I'm actually like wanting to come here now. So they're quite happy for me that I'm actually like trying to get myself somewhere. Are you happy? I am happy, yeah. As a charity, St Ed's relies heavily on local firms providing the building and other materials essential to teaching practical skills. When I first came here, they didn't have a classroom department at all. Um, we've managed to sort of work through with some, some different trade companies and gypsum and that kind of thing, and they're the ones that's provided us with all the timber, all the plaster boards, all the plaster, all the hard walls, so our guys actually get the opportunity to do some plastering. So again, we don't teach them just the basics, we actually sort of teach them something they can go away into the, into the world and have a future with. Right, so, solution goes on. Alan, an experienced painter and decorator, now teaches what he knows to others. He also reports that local firms keen to recruit skilled youngsters often help to equip St Ed's. I was presented when I got here with some very rudimentary paintbrushes. So we put some feeders out to uh, local companies, quite a big brand of paint actually, and we got back an amazing response. Uh, two boxes full of paintbrushes and rollers and roller trays, and then with that, with the right products in their hands, they can do a better finish and have a better quality of work. And, uh, and that's what we got. As well as a lack of painters and decorators, the UK needs many more construction workers too. Wow. Huge shortage of bricklayers again. Well, all construction areas. Yeah. Bricklaying's often the most oversubscribed course at St Ed's. Students know if they learn this trade and get their city and guilds, they can make a steady living. Nathan's determined to become a skilled bricklayer. He's progressing well, and while he knows construction can be tough, he's looking forward to making his way. I enjoy the hard work, if anything. So why didn't you work hard at school? It just weren't the right environment for me, to sit down at a desk every day and just put, writing on a piece of paper, but whereas here, as I'm like, I'm, yeah, more physical and active doing stuff. Aidan's mum and dad both died very young. He now lives with foster parents. Having refused schooling, his prospects weren't good, but St Ed's changed that. Aidan says he owes this charity so much. Where would you be, Aidan, if you hadn't have come to St Ed's, if you hadn't have found this place and the people here that are teaching you? I can not actually tell you. I'd be useful, useless, really. I don't know where I'd be. But, yeah, this has got me, got me in a good place. It's changed your life, Yeah, right? yeah. Definitely. Is that an exaggeration? It's changed no, your no, life? No, well, it definitely has, yeah. I don't know where I'd be without St Ed's, really. Aidan's skill and dedication have paid off. He's been recognised as a prize winner among national bricklaying trainees. He's a totally different person. He's a lot more outgoing. He's learning to communicate with other people a lot better. As before, he used to just shut down. He wouldn't talk to anyone. Didn't like school. Didn't want to do a lesson. Had the teachers chasing him day in, day out. He, would, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing now if it weren't for St Ed's. He'd be running wild in the street somewhere, not here doing what he loves doing. Um, That's a living in this him. for him, right? Yeah, he's good at it. Definitely, yeah. The skills taught at St Ed's are valuable and command decent wages. The national shortage of plasterers, bricklayers and carpenters means students know if they turn up, listen and learn, they can earn good money. I've always enjoyed woodwork. I like working with my hands. Um, I like craftsmanship. I like seeing the end results. Um, I like making stuff. Um, but yeah. Do you think you can make a living out of carpentry? Yeah. A good living? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good living. Yeah, it's a good salary. Yeah. Embarking on a course at St Ed's provides often troubled students with some purpose building self esteem. But the end goal is to help these youngsters find steady employment. That's why St Ed's employs a dedicated transitions officer to help these youngsters find their place in the world of work. The employment marketplace is difficult for anyone actually, um, whether you've got lots of qualifications or you haven't. So it is tough, but which is why we're trying to train people on industry standard qualifications that actually will mean there are routes from their training here into employment. It's possible and it happens and we have a huge success rate as far as getting people into employment is concerned here. What would happen here in Norwich if we didn't have St Ed's? There are 130 post-16 students here, 100 school students here. What would they do? Where would they go? You know, they would be a drain on society, they would be a drain on the benefit system, on the health service. 
it's absolutely essential that St Ed's is here working with these young people. Do you remember when this was all being built? Yeah, yeah. Charlie is a standout St Ed's success story. He left school with no qualifications, but is now a high-earning building surveyor, excelling in a complex specialised role. St Ed's and Lorraine's influence have been key to his success, says Charlie. But like many others who come here, his journey wasn't easy. This was the stepping stone, this was, this was the first point. And now I'm in charge of multi-million pound projects. Um, I've worked in Norwich, I've worked in London, I've worked in Essex, and I love my career. At St Ed's, Charlie found role models and mentors, people he could relate to, in a way he couldn't relate to teachers at school. I remember some staff back there, there was a guy called Martin, he was a, he was a carpentry teacher. Um, and he was brilliant, he showed me the ropes, he sort of took me under his wing. I was a young 16 year old guy, thought I knew the world but in reality I knew nothing. And uh, he just showed me the way and, and he, he you know, went out of his way a bit further then, he'd show me stuff that I could make money on the side from and from a 16 year old guy if you can make money you're making money, it's, it's brilliant. Away from the rough and tumble of mechanics and construction, St Ed's trains hair and beauty students too. Teenagers who may have struggled with mainstream education can gain valuable qualifications, such as a level two hair and beauty diploma. Many at St Ed's say that being here, being part of a community, helps bolster their mental health too. The reality is that St Ed's students often come from broken homes, some having lived through domestic violence. This charity can help them succeed, whatever their start in life. We have students who have Lots of issues. Um, some of them are previous trauma that they don't or haven't spoken about before. So when they come into a centre, especially like St Ed's, within a couple of months, young people are talking to us with topics and subjects that have affected them and they haven't spoken to anyone else before. So that's a new thing for them to disclose some quite um, horrific things, if I can be honest with you. Yeah. In St Ed's Canteen, trainee chefs prepare lunch for students and staff alike. One day these youngsters could earn a living, helping to fill the gaps in the UK's huge hospitality sector. I catch up with Tracy, mother and grandmother to several St Ed's students past and present. After her grandson Alfie lost both his parents, Tracy says St Ed's tutors helped him rebuild his life. But they gave him structure. They give him something to look forward to. They gave him all the support he needed and still do. He's now nearly 23. And working in construction? Yeah. And making a living? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he gets other kids have problems just like he does. You know what I mean? Which he didn't know none of that. He thought he was alone. So it gave him some self-esteem, yeah. some yeah. purpose? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's quite confident now. Um, and he's a dad and he's a brilliant dad, um, yeah. Now a volunteer trustee here, Tracy says St Ed's, quite literally, is a lifesaver. These kids have nowhere to go. They'd all end up on the street. Education don't want them. What would your life be like, Tracy, without St Ed's? I would have buried my grandson. As a charity, St Ed's receives no core government funding. While it gets some money for each student that attends, the college relies heavily on philanthropic donations and help from local firms. We don't actually receive any direct funding from central government. We've turned over just a million pound, just over a million pound this year. First time we've been audited. But having said that, our salary bill alone is 875,000 pounds. So it doesn't leave an awful lot, more, not lot left to run the organisation. So you're heavily reliant on grants from grant-making bodies, other charitable trusts? Absolutely. Um, because we have been in business uh, for, for a long, long time, uh, we have good reputation with a lot of the large charitable trusts. Um, but it, it is a headache because, you know, what I really want to do is see this organisation become stable so that it's available for young people forever and a day, not to have to keep worrying about where the next penny's going to come from. Lorraine pays tribute to local building firms in particular, for whom St Ed's provides a valuable service in turn, helping them identify skilled workers they can later employ. All the big construction companies 
it speaks for itself. They're supporting us. They're taking our young people on work experience, traineeships, employment. Provided you with materials and oh, tools yes. in some cases, right? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about relying on charitable trusts, yes, uh, uh, we're actually very, very well blessed from the construction industry with huge donations, and I cannot thank them enough because obviously that helps our bottom line as well if we don't have to buy all the materials. St Edmund's Society opened almost 60 years ago as a charity for homeless young people. It began to focus on vocational training in 2012, something Lorraine says must be preserved. When you see the amount of achievements, the amount of outcomes that we're getting with these young people, it's phenomenal. And also bearing in mind that some of these kids have the most challenging backgrounds that they live in and they've had more trauma in their little lives than some of us have had in a lifetime. The awards on the St Ed's reception wall point to the scale of this charity's success. Lorraine's built a strong management team but worries what will happen when she finally retires. St Ed's staff want a network of vocational training charities across the country. Why isn't there? It's a huge question um, and the answer is there should be. So we need the funding to be able to do that. There should be a St Ed's in every city or town in the country because there are young people that need our help. You know, education's a big thing and people do slip between the cracks and it's up to people like us who have got the, the sort of the, 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 the compassion just to sort of go, hey, we can help you. We can put a tool in your hands which will give the ability to make some money and you'll have some worth. And a lot and all these kids need is just sort some sort of worth. I think more places like this would be a godsend for a lot of the youth coming through who maybe haven't come from the most privileged backgrounds and therefore they need a little bit of stability, a little bit of guidance and uh, somewhere like this is fantastic for it. For people who don't have much at Christmas. St Ed's also has an outreach programme Students and staff wrap presents for others less fortunate. Lorraine says it's all part of the St Ed's training, teaching young people to be responsible and make something of their lives. You know, we want better for our young people. Let's get them trained up, qualifications, so that they can look for better opportunities, better lives, and also to be part of a community. And it's actually, it's quite a sad indictment that there are so many young people that needs services like St Ed's. So there you have it, a day in the life of St Edmunds in Norwich, a truly inspirational charity. My thanks once again to Lorraine Bliss, all staff and students at St Ed's and the Centre for Social Justice. To them and to you, all the best for 2023. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking mostly cloudy with outbreaks of rain but drier and brighter in the northwest. Here's the details. It will be cold and rather cloudy across northern Scotland this afternoon. There will be some sunny spells at times but also scattered wintry showers bringing snow to higher ground. The weather over Northern Ireland will be mostly dry with plenty of sunny spells developing. As we head into the afternoon, winds will be falling light. It will remain rather cloudy across northwest England with limited sunny spells here. There will also be some patchy rain or showers at times too. It will be very cloudy across Wales with cloud low enough to bring hill fog at times. There will be outbreaks of locally heavy rain with the driest conditions in the east. It will be overcast in the East Midlands this afternoon with prolonged at times heavy rain for all areas. It will be rather windy with strong gusts, feeling mild for this time of year. East Anglia will be cloudy throughout the afternoon with prolonged spells of locally heavy rain throughout. There will be some drier and brighter spells, but they will be limited. It'll be a windy afternoon across southern England, especially along the coast. It will be cloudy here with spells of locally heavy rain edging eastwards. Further spells of rain across southern areas while remaining cold in the north with wintry showers over northern Scotland. And that's how the weather's shaping up for the rest of the day. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage.
At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir and for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing and at times we will disagree but no one will be cancelled. Well, joining me today, it's journalist and broadcaster Danny Kelly. Smile a little. Broadcast